Akira Kurosawa, uh, born in 1910, died 1998, is one of the greatest directors in Japanese film history. His feature filmmaking career spanned a full half century from 1943 to 1993. Um, when Ran came out in 1985, there was a lot of speculation that it would be his last film. Um, he, was, he, he, he turned 75 um, just before the premiere. And, and in fact, in many ways, it feels like a, a last film. I think he, he consciously intended it as to be the sort of culmination of his career. He did actually go on to make, uh, make three more films, but they were, they're all on a, a much, much smaller, sort of lower, lower key scale. Um, and pre prior to that, he was very prolific indeed from the 1940s to the mid-1960s. We're talking roughly one film a year, give or take. And then there's, there was a dramatic slowing down in output. In fact, for the next 20 years, 1965 to 1985, he only made four films. Um, several reasons for this. Uh, first of all, there was a major financial crisis in the Japanese film industry. Um, and one of the big problems for Kurosawa was that he tended to make precisely the kind of really large scale, really big budget films that were increasingly hard to fund. So he went to Hollywood, um, where he had two fairly disastrous attempts, in fact, totally disastrous attempts at getting film projects off the ground. The first was Runaway Train, which was a sort of high speed action thriller set on a runaway train, uh, which, which was going to star Lee Marvin and Henry Fonda, um, and which was postponed indefinitely during pre production. It was eventually made, but by a, a different AK, um, Andrei Konchalovsky, that, in fact, the, the year that Ran came out. Um, more disastrously, he spent a great deal of time preparing for the film Tora Tora Tora, which is about the um, the, Pearl Har the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And that was supposed to be a big sort of West East um, co-production with Kurosawa was handling the, the Japanese point of view. And another director who Kurosawa was under the impression would be David Lean would be handling the, um, the American perspective. Um, and then the American one was actually directed by Richard Fleischer, which uh, who was a sort of uh, you know per perfectly competent director, but not in the David Lean class and not in the Kurosawa class either. And Kurosawa was none too impressed by that. And um, despite doing a huge amount of preparatory work, he was not so much fired, but placed in, in an impossible position and couldn't continue with the production. So he went back to Japan. Um, 1970, he made his first film in color, Dodes Kaden, which was a, a commercial failure. Um, and that was really the low point of his career. And in 1971, he attempted suicide uh, successfully, thankfully. Um, but it was clear that he couldn't carry on working in Japan. Um, so he, his next film was, in fact, a Soviet production, Amdersi Uzala, which was his first film in a, in a foreign language. Um, and then after that, that, that put his, his, um, his he sort of re, uh, revitalized his, his reputation as a, as a great filmmaker. Um, but he still had real problems trying to raise funds for a Japanese film. He had three projects he was developing in the late 70s. One was Ran. One was an adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's um, The Master of the Red Death, which was sadly never made. And the third was um, Kagemusha, which was another sort of his historical epic set in a sort of similar time period to Ran. And that was generally, Kagemusha was generally considered to be the more commercially appealing of the, the three projects. So that was the one that um, he ultimately ended up making. But he was only able to make it with the help of money from 20th Century Fox and the personal support of George Lucas and Francis Coppola, uh, because Toho, the studio that had funded most of Kurosawa's films up to then, um, simply just said they simply were not able to uh, finance a project on that kind of scale. Um, 20th Century Fox were fairly reluctant as well, but, um, but George Lucas um, had just made a little film called um, Star Wars and was dangling the prospect of sequels in front of Fox and suggesting that maybe they might like to fund this little Japanese, well, actually rather rather large scale Japanese film as a, as a sort of thank you. And um, so that, that did in fact prevail. Kagamusha got made, um, big hit in Japan, contrary to lots of pessimistic Japanese expectations. Um, it's competed at the Cannes Film Festival. It's shared the Palme d'Or with Bob Foss's film um, All That Jazz. And it was generally the, got the highest profile release of anything that Kurosawa had made for many, many years. Um, and it was the, that was the, th the film that managed to get Ran finally off the ground. Critics often sort of jump to conclusions with the benefit of hindsight and say that such and such a film we can now see as clearly a dry run for something else. Um, but in fact, Kurosawa himself admitted that Kagemusha was very much a dry run for Ran. He was, he was testing out various uh, things. For starters, he'd never made a historical epic, although, although he was probably his most... He certainly his most internationally renowned genre was the Jidai Geki, or the sort of historical sort of period costume epic, sometimes known as the samurai film, although not necessarily featuring samurai. And, um, 
and he'd never done one in color and um and he also hadn't done one for many many years so it, he, he he had to sort of recharge his batteries and also find new ways of of approaching it and one of the things he started to do was um he trained as a painter and he started painting out the film in a, a series of a very very elaborate uh, kind of story sort of storyboards come paintings to to sort of give a give a strong hint of the approach he was going to make to color which was highly stylized um, highly original highly distinctive and um, he was very happy with the results of that and so he he did the same approach for Rand I mean during the fundraising he would sort of visualize the film to himself just by by painting scenes from the film and that's where things like the the color coding of the armies came from Kurosawa had previously in, in 1957 made a film called Throne of Blood which was a an adaptation, a direct adaptation of Macbeth, and it's widely um, acclaimed as being one of the greatest um, Shakespeare films ever made, although paradoxically, because it's in Japanese, it doesn't actually use any of Shakespeare's original text. Um, it is still, it's, it's still one of Kurosawa's greatest films. It's an extraordinarily powerful, um, really, really concentrated work. Ran is slightly different. It is based on King Lear, but not a direct adaptation. In fact, um, he was already well into the first draft of the screenplay before he realized that there were strong similarities with King Lear coming out. Um, he was, it was originally based on the, the, the legend of a, an, a genuine 16th century Japanese warlord who, um, named Mori, who, the, the legend, legend has it, and this is dramatized in the film, he gave his three sons, his three famously loyal sons, um, three arrows individually, and then asked, asked, him to asked them to break them, which they did easily, and then gave them three arrows in a bundle and asked them to break them, and they couldn't. Um, and that was the sort of symbol of the, um, the you know, how, how strong and united the Mori clan was. And the, the lesson was that, uh, you know, together um, we are going to be stronger than anyone. And Kurosawa wondered what would happen if the sons weren't um, completely loyal. Uh, what would happen if one of them actually broke the bundle of arrows, which of course is, is possible, as is demonstrated in the film. And um, this would mean, uh, you know, would, would 16th century... Um, Japanese history, one of the sort of pivotal periods of Japanese history, have turned out rather different if one of the sons had been, one or more of the sons had been disloyal. And that's when the parallels with King Lear started to emerge. One thing he could have done, of course, would be to change the, the sons into daughters and make it a much more, much closer to the play. But that wasn't possible for various reasons, um, not least the historical fact that 16th century Japan was a, a far more patriarchal society. And it was just fairly inconceivable that a, a warlord, no matter how powerful, no matter how capricious, would um, divide up his kingdom to his, uh, to his daughters. So, so they, they remain sons. But there are still numerous parallels between uh, Goneril and Regan and Cordelia. For example, the, the, the third son, the blue one, Subaru, is um, is very much the Cordelia figure. He's the person who can, can has much clearer eyed vision of where things could go wrong, and and warns um, Lord Hidetora, the the King Lear figure, uh, and of course is is uh, is banished for his pains, um, which is obviously exactly the same thing that that happens in uh, in King Lear. Um, one very important difference. Um, Shakespeare's Lear is, um, in fact, is self-described as a foolish, fond old man. He, we don't really know very much about his past. He seems quite benevolent. Uh, maybe he is quite benevolent. We don't, we don't know. Kurosawa makes it absolutely clear right from the opening sequence that Lord Hidetera um, achieves his preeminence through absolute, total, bloodthirsty ruthlessness. Um, right at the start, we see that he is the one to successfully um, shoot the boar that they're hunting. There's then, during the, the, the discussion about the, about the arrows, they, they sort of refer to how ruthless he's been in the past. Not long after that, he actually shoots a guard dead for harassing his, uh, his jester, um, Kiyoami, um, who's the, the equivalent of the fool in Shakespeare's play. Um, so he's, he's a much, much nastier piece of work than uh, Leo. Oh, yeah, we also discover that he murdered there's, there's, um, the two key female characters, Lady Sue and Lady Kaeda. Um, in both cases, their families were completely massacred by Hidetera. They, they react to them in different ways. Sue um, turns to Buddhism and, um, and tries to achieve inner peace while Lady Kaeda, <coughs> whereas Lady Kaeda absolutely spectacularly um, goes for all out revenge. Um, now, Lady Kaeda, uh, there's no, uh, I suppose Goneril is the closest equivalent in, in, in King Lear, but of course, she's also got a huge amount of Lady Macbeth in her. Um, she's, you can see her, in fact, the, the early scene in which Hidetera goes to see um, Taro, his oldest son, and um, Kaeda's uh, husband. And you can, you can actually see that she is very much planning um, a, a revenge along the lines of, of Lady Macbeth. She's, being, she's doing it really, really coolly, really. It's a very, very stylized performance. In fact, her performance, um, Miyako Harada, who played Lady 
Kaeda and um, Tetsuya Nakadai, who plays Hidetora, they're both very, very stylized, very much influenced by the Japanese no theatre, which was a very strong influence on, on Throne of Blood. And that's a, a strong link with, with that particular film. Um, but then you get this uh, extraordinary scene after um, Kaeda's husband, um, Taro, has been, has been killed in battle. Um, her brother-in-law, Jiro, goes to see her to, to explain things. And she sort of bases himself at, uh, at his feet like a sort of good submissive sort of Japanese lady. And then when they're alone together, she erupts in this absolute frenzy, um, sort of pulling a knife on him, sort of cutting his neck. Um, and then... Uh, making it absolutely clear in a way that Lady Macbeth never did, because she the only violence she meted out was to people who were asleep. Um, and then there's this extraordinary sort of seduction scene where, uh, which culminates in a sort of full-on sort of kiss on the lips, and then she sort of, sort of starts licking the blood that's flowing from his neck, which is uh, <laughs> clearly very different from Lady Macbeth, who quite famously had a had a bit of a bit of an aversion to blood. So, uh, so yeah, but um, the other. The other thing that Kurosawa drew very much from the play was um, there's a reference in, in, the, in, in Shakespeare to nature's moulds being cracked. And Kurosawa is constantly cutting to um, the sky in particular, various cloud formations which are alternately sort of benign and sinister. And um, there's very much a sort of theme of ram, ram, the title means chaos. And Kurosawa's thesis is about what happens when a formerly incredibly powerful warlord his um, kingdom starts being rent asunder by his his successors who are just trying to basically doing exactly the same thing that he did only to each other and it ends in i mean the ending is i mean the end of king lear is pretty bleak but uh, but kurosawa goes one step further i mean it ends with the sort of blind surumaru who is uh, the equivalent of gloucester in the play only crucial difference being he was blinded by Hidetara himself, not by Hidetara or Lear's, Lear's enemies. And he's sort of standing on the end of a, the edge of a precipice with a Buddhist scroll and just lets it sort of uh, drop, lets it drop into the abyss. It's, it's one, of the, one of the most downbeat endings I can imagine, or certainly in, in, in Kurosawa's films as well as anyone else's. Kurosawa told the uh, critic Michael Wilmington that one of his inspirations for Ran was, was the constant threat of nuclear apocalypse, which is, is a recurring theme in Kurosawa's films. Um, there's, he, he tackles it directly in a film called I Live in Fear, which was, um, which was a film about a man absolutely terrified of nuclear apocalypse. And that was made just 1955, just 10 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombed. And then in Dreams, which was the film he made immediately after Ran, he... Um, one of the episodes in Dreams also tackles the theme of sort of nuclear holocaust. And uh, one of Kurosawa's chief assistants during this whole period from Kagamusha to the end of his career was a man called Ishiro Honda, who was, um, he goes right back to the, they, they were been old friends for since the 1930s. They started off as assistant directors. And then Honda went on to make a, a powerfully anti-nuclear film called Godzilla. And, and in fact, he then directed a large number of the subsequent Godzilla films and, uh, um, and went, started working as Kurosawa's assistant because he thought it would elevate his career back onto a sort of more, more artistically respectable plane. So again, you have, um, you know, you've got, you've got two, two filmmakers who both have very, very strong, uh, very strong concerns about sort of nuclear devastation. And although there's no, obviously no nuclear devastation in a film set in 16th century Japan, one of Kurosawa's key themes was the introduction of what by those standards were weapons of mass destruction, um, namely the, the musket, which was first brought to Japan in the 17th century, by 16th century, by a load of um, Portuguese traders. And within 10 years, uh, hundreds of thousands of them had been copied. And um, so for the, the first time, relatively unskilled soldiers were able to kill people from a great distance, because you had, you had archers before, but that, that demands a high level of skill, high level of training. Um, and so, so, you know, mass destruction had come to Japan for the first time, and I think that was very much consciously one of um, Kurosawa's themes. And also, talking of mass destruction, another key influence on the whole of Kurosawa's um, career and sort of general sensibility was the, the great um, 1923 earthquake that devastated Yokohama and Tokyo. Um, Kurosawa was a 13-year-old schoolboy at the time, and his, his older brother took him to see the devastation in Tokyo firsthand, and he, he never forgot it. Um, not just the, uh, the, the first-hand impression of Japan sliding into chaos, because the, the devastation was just appalling, um, but also what happens as a byproduct of that chaos, because there was an extreme Japanese nationalist used this as an excuse to, to attack Koreans, um, usually through sort of trumped-up accusations that they were poisoning the wells. I mean, you know, why would they poison the wells? There's no rationale for it at all. And in his autobiography, Kurosawa said that um, one well, they said, was poisoned, because there was a Korean um, 
the Korean text next to it saying this well has been poisoned. Actually, it was a random scribble that Kurosawa had made himself. So he knew that the Koreans were completely innocent in that. So, so again, that, that whole notion of, of things, things just falling apart and just descending into chaos. Um, 1923 to 1985, you know, 62 years later, it's still, it's still there. Another challenge that Kurosawa had was to do with the, the locations. Um, Japan had, th this was the first um, film that he made that was shot substantially on location for, for many, many years in, in Japan. And one of the problems is that Japan had urbanized so much by the, the early 1980s, it was very, very difficult to find the kind of sort of great sweeping plains that he wanted. Um, Sidney Lumet, the director who uh, championed a, a, a great big push for the, for the Oscars for Ran, um, asked Kurosawa why he'd framed a particular shot a particular way. And Kurosawa said, well, if I move the camera a little bit to the left, you'd have seen the Sony factory. And if it had been moved a little bit to the right, um, you'd have seen the, the airport. Um, and so he was, he was sort of like hamstrung by that to a certain, a certain extent. Um, a lot of the film was shot in the, the slopes of sort of Mount, Mount Aso and, and Mount Fuji, of course, a big distinct volcano famous for its very black ash. It's a very distinctive location. In fact, ideal as a kind of sort of equivalent of the kind of sort of blasted heath of, uh, of, of Shakespeare's King Lear.